can be prevented, prostate, breast, or colorectal? And the answer is only colorectal can be prevented. You can detect breast cancer at an early stage. You can detect prostate cancer at an early stage. But only colon cancer can be prevented. I think I alluded to before, uh, colon cancer is the third most form of, third most uh, common form of colon, colon cancer is the third most common type of cancer. It is the second leading cause of cancer death. One out of three patients who are diagnosed with colon cancer will die from their disease. Uh, overall, there's about a one in 20 or 5% lifetime risk of developing colon cancer. If you have a first degree relative, if your mother, father, brother, sister, if any of them have colon cancer, then instead of a 5% risk, it's, it's about double that. It's about a 10% chance of developing colon cancer. Uh, some of the risk factors for colon cancer include age. Um, most colon cancers occur, or 90% will occur in, in, in age past 50. Uh, as I mentioned before, family history is important. Uh, race, uh, blacks tend to be, um, often are diagnosed at an earlier or it's more common in blacks, and in blacks have a more aggressive disease. They're often um, diagnosed at a more advanced stage. Uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis, are at increased risk. And then these last four are kind of, uh, these can be managed with you know, a high-fat diet and consumption, a lot of red meat are associated with colon cancer, being overweight and lack of exercise heavy use of alcohol and tobacco are all associated with colon cancer or in increased risk of colon cancer. Now, how do you know if, if you are at high risk due to your family history? If you have one first degree relative that's diagnosed at an age less than 60, we think that's a more significant risk factor than if you uh, had a, a parent that was diagnosed when they were in their 80s, or 70s or 80s at, at advanced age. So th these patients need to be uh, screened at an earlier age or if you have two or more first degree relatives that have been diagnosed at any age. So if you have a, one of your parents or a sibling diagnosed at any age, that, that is considered higher risk. So who should be screened? We, we think everyone beginning at age 50. Uh, there is a recommendation by the American College of Gastroenterology that African Americans should begin screening at age 45 rather than age 50. Um, if you have one of the family history, then we sh you should begin screening at age 40 or 10 years before the relative was diagnosed. So if your parent was diagnosed at age 45, then uh, you should be start screening at age 35. And then we do think at some point that the uh, benefit of screening and surveillance outweighs, the, or the risk outweighs the benefit. So whenever life expectancy is less than 10 years or when you reach at age 85, we think it's really not important to continue screening or surveillance for, for colon polyps. Now, um, you can, there the are different ways, that, um, different tests that can be used for screening. Uh, in the past, we did a lot of fecal occult blood testing where um, you take cards home, a stool would be smeared on a card, the cards would be returned and they would put a developer on to detect uh, microscopic bleeding. Uh, that's been somewhat replaced by something called the fecal immunochemical test, and that's a more specific test for human hemoglobin, so it's a, it's a better test. And then there's a, a brand new test called this Cologuard. Actually, there's an ad on TV I saw recently where a stool sample is sent to a lab, it's packed on ice, and they actually look at the DNA and they detect uh, changes in the DNA that would detect cancer. But these are all um, cancer detection tests. We really aren't detecting polyps by, by any of these, these methods. Now, the, 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 the tests that look for structural abnormalities in the colon, we think these actually can detect polyps, which are you know, gross or abnormal tissue that may develop in, into cancer. In the past, we'd do a lot of flexible sigmoidoscopy where we'd just be looking at the lower part of the colon um, sometimes in conjunction with a barium enema. Um, the problem with just doing the flexible sigmoidoscopy is that it's good at detecting polyps in the rectum and the sigmoid colon, but you could have a polyp over here, oops, over here on this side of the colon that, that would not be seen. 
Um, a lot of times we do a sigmoidoscopy, this is in the past, we do a sigmoidoscopy with a barium enema. Something might show up on the barium enema and then the patient ends up having to have a colonoscopy. So we're having three procedures rather than one procedure. So we've gotten, gotten away from sigmoidoscopy and air contrast barium enema. Uh, there's a, a newer type of procedure called CT colonography or also called CT colonoscopy. It's a CAT scan and they can actually recreate what the inside of the colon looks like on a CAT scan. Um, however, it's probably not as, 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 as good at detecting very small polyps inside the colon. And if a polyp is seen on the CT colonography, well then that, those patients need, need to have a, a regular or optical colonoscopy. And polyps are very common. In uh, age past 50, probably 25% of men will have an adenomatous polyp and 15% of women will have an adenomatous polyp. So if we're just doing these CT colonographies, a lot of those patients are going to end up having to have a regular colonoscopy as well. And then there's a lot of radiation associated with the CT uh, colonography. Every, I see quite a few patients with recurring abdominal pains and they go to the emergency room and they, if you show up in the emergency room complaining about your abdomen, then you're going to get a CT scan. And it's like getting several hundred x-rays with the, every time you get a CT scan. And I think long term that's going to put those, these patients at a higher risk for abdominal and pelvic cancers. So we think that the colonoscopy really is the best test in that we can both uh, detect cancer, but we can also uh, detect polyps, which can develop into cancer. We think uh, nearly all cancer comes from, from, from these little polyps called adenomas. It takes a long time for a small polyp to develop into cancer. By doing these colonoscopies and removing these polyps, we feel we can prevent most people from ever, ever developing colon cancer. It's important to realize, though, that not all these adenomas will get bigger, but it's impossible to know which ones will and which ones won't. So whenever we see a polyp, we always remove it and it's sent to the lab and it's looked at under a microscope by a pathologist. So there are always risk to a colonoscopy. Uh, bleeding is maybe one of the most frequent um, complications, from colon especially if a polyp is removed there may be about a 1% risk of having bleeding afterwards. Um, the bleeding may not be immediately, it may, it may be even days later. Um, most of the times, for any kind of serious bleeding patient, the patient may need to be admitted to the hospital. Occasionally a blood transfusion might be needed if, if, um, if there is a massive bleeding. Sometimes a colonoscopy would be repeated. We try to find where the polypectomy site that's bleeding and we can either cauterize it or put clips on that to, to stop bleeding. Whenever we remove polyps, especially with a cautery, there's a risk of causing a burn on the colon. Those patients will often experience some abdominal pain. It usually gets better in just a few days. Um, and then perforation, that's our most feared complication. That occurs maybe one or two out of a thousand patients who have a, a procedure done. Uh, again, sometimes the perforation may be an immediate, immediately recognized. Other times it may be you know, a day or two later the patient develops abdominal pain and come back to the hospital. And then there's small uh, risks associated with the sedation that's given for a colonoscopy. Now the, the worst part of the procedure, of course, is, is the bowel prep. Um, in the past we used like the new lightly Go light, co lightly, which is a four liter uh, solution that was given the day before the procedure. And patients always had a hard time get, getting that all down. And we've kind of gotten away from those preps and we're using more of Sue Prep, uh, Movie Prep, or this Miralax and Gatorade. And we really get the best results if, if the dose is split, where you take half the dose the day before the procedure and the second half the day of the procedure. It does involve often getting up early in the morning, maybe at 2 o'clock in the morning to take that second dose, but we really get better results. And you know, it's a better, the better the bowel prep, the better the exam is, the more confident that we can be that, that we're not missing any type of small polyp. So um, th prior to the procedure, uh, we always want to know if, if someone's on any kind of blood thinner like Coumadin or these newer ones like Xarelto or Eliquis. Also, we want to know about antiplatelet medications including aspirin, Plavix, or 
this newer one called Effient. And we generally would like to stop, stop these, especially if a polyp is, needs to be removed. We really can't remove a polyp if someone is on a blood thinner like Coumadin and Xarelto or Eliquis. Um, most of the times we would also want to withhold aspirin and Plavix. As, um, we usually would consult the cardiologist or the prescribing physician to make sure it's okay. Uh, patients with atrial fibrillation, you hear more and more about that. Those patients generally can come off their, their anticoagulation without any problem. Um, patients who've had a stent in their artery, and especially within the past year, if they're on aspirin and Plavix following a stent, the cardiologist, they really never want them to stop that for any reason. And so we really wouldn't be doing a, colon a screening colonoscopy in a patient who uh, had a stent placed within the past year. On the day before the procedure, it's very important to begin a clear liquid diet. Clear liquid means that you could actually you know, put a newspaper or print and, and be able to read through, read through it. So it's most, mostly just um, uh, jello and, and broth and popsicles, no solid food. We would like patients to avoid um, red, orange, or purple jello because it often we see this reddish fluid that's often confused for blood if, if someone consumes, especially like any of those. Uh, colored types of uh, liquids. And then we tell patients to start that bowel prep, splitting the dose. So they take half, half the day before and then half on the day, early on the day of the procedure. So on the day of the procedure, they get up early, finish their bowel prep. If they're on blood pressure medication or heart medication, we usually have them take that with a small amount of water before coming into the um, surgery center or the hospital. Uh, diabetic medications are usually held. It's important that uh, the patient have a driver because of the sedation that is administered and we would, would not allow patients to drive home uh, following a sedation. Uh, patients usually need to be at the, at the surgery center or the hospital at least an hour ahead of time. The nurses need to go over their history and then they, uh, there's also the anesthesiologist that also needs to go over the history as well and IV is placed in that time. The procedure itself takes about 30 minutes and then patients usually spend about 30 minutes in the recovery room. So overall, it's about two hours or two or three hours at the surgery center or the hospital. Now here's, here's a video. This is a video of an actual colonoscopy. It's a pretty good bowel prep. There's now, some liquid did there. A great job at yeah, just, preparing for the exam by taking a bowel prep. You'll notice that there is very clear liquid inside the colon instead of round and solid stool. Slowly withdraw, being careful to examine. 
examine the colonic mucosa in a clockwise fashion, it doesn't necessarily have to be clockwise, but as long as we're seeing a 360 degree view of the colonic wall. We use water to wash away any stool or sediment, and we can use suctioning by which to withdraw that liquid. We inspect carefully to look for polyps. Polyps are ingrowths of tissue that can occur within the colon, and they can also be precancerous. If found, they would be removed at the time of the colonoscopy. And from the sigmoid colon, we move back to our starting point, which is the rectum. At this point, the last part of the examination, we do what's called a retroflexion we turn the camera back on itself to look at the anal verge and look for anything like polyps that could have been missed on the way in, or hemorrhoids. In this case, our patient has some small hemorrhoids, as you can see there. But the good news for this patient today is that no polyps were found. Can we go on to the next slide? This is a patient had a very poor bowel prep. We'll just briefly show this real quickly. <laughs> Actually, have sound effects and everything. <laughs> It's really going to be hard to detect any kind of small polyp when you have a bowel prep that looks like this. I think there are some patients who just have really bad constipation that, that even though they do the bowel prep and follow the directions, they're still going to have a bad bowel prep. But then there are a lot of patients who just but don't, don't, don't do what they were supposed to do. Sorry. <laughs> 